there. Hey, Kent, let me ask you this question real quick. When when people, when archaeologists dig up bones in a dirt, as you often say in your seminars, what how how are they justifying the fact that these bones could be millions or billions of years old? All they see is bones in a dirt. I, I, go into that for me because that's fascinating. Because what they'll say is, of course, we have proof for evolution. We have millions and millions of fossils. We have thousands and thousands of bones. Why why wouldn't that be proof for evolution? Go into that just a little, if you wouldn't mind. Well, it, there are a lot of people who make a full-time living digging up bones in the dirt. Okay, My dog did the same thing, only nobody paid him to do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, what, they dig up these bones out of the dirt, technically out of the rock, and they, they don't have a date stamped on them, obviously. And, but yet they'll make up this number of how old it is. I say, how do you possibly know that? They say, well, we date the fossils by which layer they're com- they come from, by the layer of strata. Oh, well, how do you know the age of the layer of strata? Oh, well, we date the strata by the types of fossils they have in them. I said, no, wait a minute. I thought you dated the fossils by the rocks. <laughs> well, we do. Whoops. Well, not, but you're dating the rocks by the fossils. Well, yeah, yeah, we date the rocks by the fossils. But I thought you said you dated the fossils by the rocks. <laughs> yeah. It's pure circular reasoning. It's absolute stupidity. They date the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the rocks. It's real dumb. Okay, This whole geologic column that kids learn in school, you know, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, the only place you're ever going to find that geologic column is in the textbooks. It doesn't exist in reality. It's true the Earth has layers, but they formed all in one big flood in the days of Noah. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting these layers. How about They're called that? polystrata fossils. Hundreds of them are found. You can see pictures of dozens and dozens of them on video number six of my seminar series. Anyway, I ask them the question. I say, guys, why do you think these fossils prove evolution? And they'll say, well, look, it's a little different than the ones we have alive today. Okay. Well, therefore, they'll say it must be the ancestor. It must be a transitional fossil or something. I say, you got to be kidding. A bone you found in the dirt, all you know is it died. You cannot prove it had any children. Right, yeah. And you sure can't prove it had different children. And why would anybody with half a brain and one eye think that a bone you found in the dirt can do something that no animal today can do, which is produce other than its kind? <laughs> I mean, dogs produce dogs, cows produce cows. If you know of an exception, I'd like to see it. Not hear about it. I'd like to see it. You, you know, no, it, I, 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 I got to ask you this question, Doctor. I mean, me and my wife were just talking about this today. I saw an actual drawing of a, I don't know if it was based on fossils or how they did it, but apparently the giraffe, for instance, was is related to a short donkey slash anteater slash horse with spots and stripes. How and why would they make drawings of something that uh, from from a bone? I, I'm just trying to understand the, their concept, especially when you have a very interesting design. Well, and how do you tell from the bones that it had spots or stripes? I'd really be <laughs> curious to hear about that. <laughs> that's, that's a great point. Like I'm off. Like I've often said, you'd have to have help to be that stupid. I don't see how anybody can believe such a thing. But, yeah, you can tell by the bones <laughs> uh, that it had spots. Wow. These guys are good. They're really good. They must have had a government grant of a couple hundred million dollars to work on that project. Wow. That's yeah, incredible. In the dirt only proves some, it only proves something died. That's all it is. With, and why do we have fossils at all? Well, fossils don't form unless they're buried rapidly in mud, like a flood would do. Noah's flood explains all the fossils. You know, how many animals die today in the world? You know, probably millions, okay? How many are gonna turn to fossils? They're probably none, because they're not buried. The coyotes and the ravens and the crows are gonna drag them all over the woods. (laughs) You're not even gonna find two bones together. Yet we find whole skeletons, completely articulated. You know, laid out like it drowned and was preserved in the mud. Well, yeah, oil down in the ground is from the fo- from the animals that drowned in the flood. They can take uh, plant material or animal material and under heat and pressure, 
turn it into, oh, I don't know about plant material, maybe they turn that to coal, but they can turn the animal material into oil in a matter of 20 minutes. Wow, with how heat about and that? Pressure. Hey, hey, hey so Ken, I got to... I got to cover all that in my video series. Oh, go ahead. Zero, uh, video series number what now? Well, I cover all that in the video series. The video series is 18 hours long. I'm sorry about it. And I talk really fast. I use over 7,000 <laughs> slides in PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, and everything's referenced at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, so people can stop, stop the tape. And uh, uh, But, uh, yeah, I would encourage people to get that and share it with their friends. They can go to 2peter3.com. The whole seminar series is uh, like $89 for 18 hours of all that and they can make all the copies they want just don't sell it and don't change it well i have a call here i got somebody on hold that like to talk to you i think i know who this is he's a wonderful brother in the lord and i think he might have a question for you dr hoven i'm going to put him on right now okay okay sure hello 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 hello, hello dr hovai yes sir yes sir my name's lynn and yes, I'm, I'm so very happy to hear you. I, I, I've heard you before when you debated uh, Dr. Ross, and that was very, very uplifting in that debate that you had there. Well, thank you. I have a question for you. Do you, 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 you just talked about uh, bones. Have you done any work, uh, research, on uh, the T-Rex uh, bones found in Montana by Mary Schweitzer? The, the the tissue that they found in there that was supposedly 70 million years old, but yet it was still, uh, uh, you know, tissue. They could still. squeeze it. and you Have you done any work? Uh, well, I didn't do any research on it. I, I read about it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. They, they, here's dinosaur tissue that is still soft, still flexible, still red blood cells. Okay. Uh-huh. And th- so they're, they're sitting around trying to figure out how can this stay soft for 70 million years? The thought will never cross their brain that it's not 70 million years old. I don't see how they just won't even think of that. <laughs> they're, look, they're trying desperately to figure out how can dinosaur tissue stay soft for 70 million years. 70 million years. <laughs> okay, well, I just can't help somebody like that. I, th- I no. think we're done talking. With, you know. would, that constitute, right. would that constitute someone holding the truth in unrighteousness? Absolutely. See, they yeah. just simply cannot admit there's a creation or a flood or a coming judgment. Second Peter 3, 2peter3.com, yeah. the number 2, the word Peter, and the number 3 is my website. All they right. Cannot, they can't admit it. But thank you for the question. Yeah, well, thank that. you, doctor. Have a All good right, night. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, thank you, caller. And that was uh, Len out of New York, and uh, I know him very well. He's actually uh, a very dear brother in the Lord to me. And uh, actually, as a matter of fact, he's my uncle, which is fantastic. I'm glad he called. Thank you for calling. Um, It's really quite fascinating. Now, going back to these fossils, another thing that they'll say is that, well, we have lots of proof. We have have thousands and thousands of fossils. Again, Howard, so they're justifying it simply by using some sort of um, carbon dating methods. I mean, there's lots of different dating methods. Can you, can you talk a few minutes about that? Well, sure. None of these dating methods were invented until after World War II. So they were teaching this great age of millions of years way before they had any carbon dating or potassium argon dating or rubidium strontium or lead 208 or lead 206 or uranium 235, uranium 238. Uh, all of the dating methods are based on the assumption that this radioactive element decays at a certain rate and that the rate remains constant and that we can somehow know the initial content when the creature died or was buried in the rock layer. None of those can be known. In a court of law, they would laugh at carbon dating or any dating method. So you've got to be kidding. It's, it's pure assumptions. It's a whole bunch of assumptions. I give about a 30-minute answer to that on uh, video number seven. The question answer series, which is five hours long, <laughs> just that one DVD, uh, on the uh, assumptions based on carbon dating and potassium argon dating. And I give a whole bunch of examples of how it has never worked. Never. Well, how about uh, that? That's incredible. If, if, you take, if, you take, if you take a sample in to get it carbon dated, the first thing they're going to ask is, where did you find it? W- what difference does that make where I found it? Carbon date it, please. They'll say, oh, no, we have to know the place where you found it so we can get the bracket 
of what age we're looking for. <laughs> that's, like, that's very convenient. <laughs> well, yeah, because they can date the same sample five times and get five different dates. Yeah. So they can pick which pick which number you'd like. How old would you like it to be? Wow. Oh, I'd like it to be about three thirty four hundred. Okay, well then we'll we'll make it thirty four hundred. We'll keep testing it until that comes up. <laughs> it is it is that dumb, brother. Well, wow. you know, with the few minutes you have left, you also talk about something quite fascinating. Speaking of fossils and rock layers, you talk a little bit about the Grand Canyon. You know, I think a lot of people listening tonight, if and they are listening, I don't know where they are. Um, if they are listening tonight, then they are they know about the Grand Canyon. And I think the Grand Canyon, I haven't been there yet. I heard it's fascinating. In fact, there's a uh, some kind of bridge made of glass you could walk on. I don't know if I'd do that, but uh, they have a, they have a, gla a glass bridge. But, the, you know, the Grand Canyon has been a spectacle and a, a wonder of the world for a very long time, uh, ever since people were able to travel and check it out. Tell me a little bit about what you what is believed by the evolutionists to carve out the Grand Canyon, and then explain the more reliable source, we'll just say it that way, of what caused the Grand Canyon. Well, they will tell you the Grand Canyon took millions of years to form, okay? Because it's this mile deep canyon carved through solid rock. Well, if you walk down in it and look, you'll see it consists of, you know, thousands of strata, layers, okay? Well, so obviously it used to be mud. It wasn't always solid rock. Now, the top of Grand Canyon I had an atheist one time. He said, Hoban, you're so stupid. Don't you know it took millions of years to form Grand Canyon? I said, well, sir, did you know the Grand Canyon, the river running in the bottom of Grand Canyon, runs downhill? He said, well, yeah. I said, okay. The river starts cutting the canyon at Page, Arizona, where it's less than 3,000 feet above sea level, 2,800 feet. It ends up at Lost Wages, Nevada, where it's 1,800 feet above sea level. So it loses about a thousand feet of elevation as it flows 277 miles. And all the time I'm saying this, I'm flashing up PowerPoint, you know, proving my point. And that's <laughs> correct. Okay, so the Grand Canyon is 277 miles long and it drops from about 3,000 feet to 2,000 foot elevation above sea level. He said yes. I said, okay, in between those two points, there's a huge bump, a big ridge called the Kaibab Plateau that's about 7,000 or 8,000 feet above sea level. He said, that's correct. <clears throat> I said, okay, if the river starts cutting the canyon at 3,000 feet, and the ridge in the way is 8,000 feet high, rivers don't flow uphill in Florida, and I don't think they do in Arizona either. <laughs> it's a funny gravity, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that, that river could not have made that canyon. It would have to flow uphill for millions of years to start cutting the canyon. <clears throat> Grand Canyon is a washed out spillway. If you filled up Grand Canyon with dirt, that would take a lot of dirt, by the way. But if you filled it up right. and made a dam out of it, it would a lake would back up that would cover half of Colorado and half of Utah. Wow. Okay. Then when it finally got too deep, it would come right over that spot and, and all that water, once it starts rushing through, it's pretty soon, it's not just water. It's liquid sandpaper. It's picking up debris and rocks and gravel and mud, and it's going to cut through there like like, like buzzsaw. Grand Canyon probably formed in a couple of weeks as wow. that giant lake drink. We didn't form over millions of years. That's dumb. So that's incredible. So uh, so that's quite a bit uh, different than assuming that a river cut, or, cut it out over millions of years. This thing would have washed the thing out in just a few short weeks, which makes more sense. Well, we've seen that hundreds of times when a farmer builds a dam to hold water for his cows and he doesn't have a good spillway. You know, or you get a big flood or heavy rain come in and it, wash, it doesn't wash out the whole dam. It finds the lowest place and cuts a slot and drains the lake, usually in minutes. In St. Louis, in 2005, they had a big reservoir called the Tom Sauk Reservoir, T-A-U-M-S-A-U-K, outside the city of St. Louis. And it got too full, and the, the, the dam failed that held this reservoir in place. It lost 1.5 billion, with a B, gallons of, of, uh, of water in 10 minutes. Wow. The whole reservoir in 10 minutes. And it didn't wash away the whole dam. It washed out one little slot, one little section. And it looks like a miniature Grand Canyon. It made in 10 minutes. 
Right, all that water pressure, I would imagine, would have done something like that. That's incredible. (laughs)